This video describes how a science-based model of imagery, in conjunction with hypnosis, can be used to maximize sports performance. Competing in the Ironman Triathlon in Hawaii started my awareness of the altered state of mind that it took to participate in ultra-endurance events. Subsequently, in an extreme biathlon, 23,000 feet of vertical climbing, and temperatures ranging from 45 degrees centigrade to minus 7, from Death Valley to the peak of Mount Whitney, I experienced a four-hour loss of time. Fascinated by the experience of this trance state, I turned my studies to hypnosis. I received my advanced clinical education in hypnosis through the University of California, San Diego, in conjunction with the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. UCSD offered the course to physicians and health professionals as an adjunct to traditional medicine. During the time of my participation in UCSD's program, I also taught and coached at another University of California campus. I began integrating clinical hypnosis knowledge into my coaching and added it to my health education syllabus. The results of various neuroimaging studies tell us that when an individual physically performs an action, areas of the brain that are associated with movement planning and control become more active, forming a distinctive pattern of neural activation. However, what is galvanizing is that the same area of the brain also becomes active during mental practice. This evidence indicates that mental practice can be used to enhance, mold, and support the neural circuitry involved in active movement, even without physical practice. This is particularly important in sports performance because this means the neural connections associated with precise movement can be preserved, even during periods of physical inactivity, such as during recovery or during injury. This theory is called functional equivalence. For an example, if an athlete images themselves kicking a football, the areas of the brain, which become active when they actually kick a football, activate during imagery of the task. Functional equivalence proposes that this activation through imagery can strengthen the neural activity which would occur during the execution of the movement and consequently improve motor output and sporting success. This activation of neural areas during imagery can also lead to other physiological responses which are reflective of the actual situation, such as increases in heart rate and ventilation frequency and muscle activity. Despite the apparent consensus that imagery is an important psychological skill, there has been little agreement in the sports psychology literature as to how imagery should be used. Additionally, copious research studies can be found on this topic, which span many fields of science, including applied sports psychology, mainstream psychology, cognitive psychology, and neuroscience journals. This academic diversity has proven a challenge for sports psychology practitioners, coaches, and athletes to make use of the studies in their practical work. Realizing the need for a model based on solid theoretical and empirical foundations to help guide practitioners' use of imagery, Holmes and Collins in 2001 devised PETLAP. This is an acronym representing a seven-point checklist of guidelines to be followed when devising an imagery intervention. The use of this model should be highly individualized, as every athlete has a unique way of processing information. I have used quotations from gymnasts to describe their imagery experiences. Their initials have been changed for privacy reasons. The first letter of the acronym represents the physical factor and is the most important PETLAB component. Let us look at these senses and see how each one of them can be included in the gymnastic environment. The first being visual. When you walk into the gym, what do you see? Close your eyes and take a snapshot. What is the layout of the apparatus? What is the lighting like? What are the colors of the walls? Second is auditory. What are the noises you hear? when you walk into the gym. People talking and laughing, athletes landing on crash mats or sticking a landing on the beam. 
Third is kinesthetic. This means activating your imagery to the sense of touch. For example, how do your hands feel when you wrap them in preparation for your uneven bar routine? What does it feel like on your feet to stick a landing? This is something that could be beneficial to a gymnast experiencing the twisties. That is, the feeling of losing one sense of space and dimension while in the air. Most of the gymnasts describe actually moving their bodies during imagery, while some discuss tensing certain muscle groups associated with the image skills. One gymnast stated, So I am like putting my body in the position I was supposed to be in, and also feeling my muscles, like squeezing my muscles like they were active, like they were doing the skill. For me, that just made it more real. Another gymnast described how imaging prior to her vault gave her more confidence. I usually go through the vault, you know, a couple of times in my head. I would picture the vault, you know, maybe not even with the whole run, just the actual hitting the springboard, pushing off the vault, landing on my feet, that whole thing. It is well worth the practitioner spending time with individual athletes, finding out which kinesthetic sensations are most relevant to them and incorporating these as much as possible. For example, if an athlete feels his or her heart pounding at a particular point when completing a skill, this should be incorporated into the imagery. Research suggests that imagery ability is not a static trait, but rather this can be improved upon through a process known as response training. In this training, athletes are asked to focus upon their physiological and behavioral responses specific to the scenario to be imagined, and then to incorporate these into the imagery. Therefore, when an athlete does not have a strong kinesthetic perception, we would recommend the careful use of response training to enhance the vividness of his or her kinesthetic imagery. Fourth is olfactory, or using your sense of smell. A smell can trigger all sorts of emotions and memories. Smell can also be used as a relaxation trigger. You can experiment with many types of herbs. Lavender has been researched extensively. Last is gustatory or using your sense of taste. Imagine what your favorite snacks are when you are training or competing. How do they make you feel? Much like smell, taste can elicit strong emotional responses. The component environment relates to the place where the imagery is performed. If it is not possible to perform imagery in an environment that is at least similar to the competitive one, then audio, video, and photographs can be used to assist the imagery experience. Arriving at the venue the day before competition and being able to go into the facility can stimulate your imagery senses. Being able to practice where you are competing increases the potential for greater imagery vividness. How do you feel differently when you are performing at your own venue as opposed to a competitive venue? Observe how these feelings differ. JT describes her experience. I'm imagining me presenting to the judges and my heart rate's going up and I'm really nervous, but at the same time, I'm confident and I know what I can do, what I do in my practice. And so the crowd's there and I got a floor routine in the background with the music coming on. It's a quad meet, and it's loud, and people are yelling and cheering and clapping, and I see myself going through my routine in those conditions. The component task emphasizes that the content of the imagery should be appropriate to the skill level and individual preference of the athlete, particularly regarding attentional focus. When planning an imagery intervention, it is particularly useful to confer with the gymnast regarding their attentional focus during performance. This will allow the imagery intervention to be tailored to the specific needs of the athlete. Novice gymnasts should avoid imaging as an elite level gymnast because this is not as functionally equivalent to their current experience. Naturally, as their skill progresses, the individual will progress their imagery too. The component timing refers to the pace at which the imagery is completed, the idea being to perform imagery in real time whenever possible, as timing is often crucial to the successful execution of sports skills. However, 
More research is needed on the possible use of slow motion imagery, as there are some interesting questions that remain to be explored, such as whether slow motion imagery could be useful in correcting errors on form-based skills. The component learning considers the skill level of the performer, emphasizing that the content of the imagery should be adapted as the individual becomes more skilled. Research shows that when content of the imagery was updated regularly to reflect the progress of the participants, performance of the skill was also enhanced. The imagery intervention should not just be updated in terms of changes in skill level, but also changes in psychological states, such as confidence and motivation, should be considered. The component emotion relates to the fact that competitive sport is an emotion-laden experience, and therefore for imagery to be realistic, the emotions felt during performance should be mentally recreated during imagery practice. Personalized emotion-laden imagery scripts led to greater muscle activity and higher self-rated imagery vividness compared to more generic interventions. Several gymnasts described how injuries had limited their ability to physically practice. In these situations, the gymnasts use imagery as a substitute for practice. Using imagery while injured helped these gymnasts prepare for their return to competition. KW stated that imaging skills while injured helped to prepare her for upcoming performances. I found that even if I didn't have the opportunity to practice my skills, if I visualized them, I was right back where I left off because of the practice that I had done in my head. I was really successful in being able to compete at the level I wanted with very, very minimal physical practice. I had done the mental practice to back it up. JV summarized the importance of using imagery while injured. I'd been injured quite a lot through my career, and sometimes I would just sit there and visualize my routines when I could not physically do them. Dealing with injuries and using imagery became an important aspect of preparing for movement for these gymnasts. All the gymnasts acknowledged that imagery allowed them to experience a greater sense of confidence. This confidence was often a byproduct of imaging correct performances or rehearsing skills repetitively. The more imagery I did, the more successful and confident I became. To do it just by seeing it go right into my head. If I fell a hundred times in my warm-up, it didn't bother me because when I did it in my head, it was perfect and I knew I could do it. So just as I gained more confidence in my routines and my skills, my mental aspects really, really grew. Many gymnasts talked about using their imagery for boosting confidence right before performing a routine. JB provided an example of how imagery enhanced her confidence before her beam routine. I can see myself doing it. I believe in myself that I can actually do it, so I know I can do it no matter what. Visual perspective refers to the viewpoint of the performer during imagery. This can be internal, through the eyes of the performer, or external, seeing oneself performing as if watching on TV. It is especially important to consider individual preferences, which should be done by collaborating closely with the athlete and experimenting with different perspectives in a practice setting. Some athletes just prefer external imagery or find internal imagery difficult. In such cases, it's always preferable to accommodate the athlete's wishes as far as possible so that the athlete is comfortable with what he or she has been asked to do. In conclusion, much like physical training programs, mental skills programs should be systematically planned, controlled and evaluated and integrated into the athlete's existing training regime, enabling them to better understand the benefits of commitment to this aspect of training. The focus of the mental training should be goal-orientated, which enhances the motivation for the athlete and helps them to see the progress they are making. The smallest of margins in terms of physical skill separate athletes from elite sports, so enhancing mental skills can make a crucial difference in competition. Like any other physical skill, the more you do it, the better you become at it. The same applies to mental training. Different sports have different physiological demands. Team sports and individual sports like tennis will have different demands. Therefore, it is important to talk to each athlete 
and assess the physiological demands to which they are exposed. No two sports are the same, and certainly no two athletes are identical. All mental skills programs should be unique and specifically tailored to the individual needs of each athlete. Finally, be aware that imagery comes more naturally to some than to others. In these individuals, recreating the various sensory experiences can prove challenging and the resulting mental image is vague, unrealistic and ineffective. However, people's ability to imagine an event or action is much like any other skill in that it can be improved with practice. Feel free to add your experiences of imagery in the comment section of this video. How you personalize your experience could be of great benefit to others. For research-related resources, go to my webpage at www.barryjones.com.